And we're back uh, once again. So welcome um, for everybody joining us, whether it is your first time or you know, you've been along to everyone or, or just a couple. Uh, this is Oak Barrel After Hours live chat. Joe and Scotty sit here, do things, talk, have drinks and all the rest of it. Uh, number eight, um, which, which we're here for. Um, so if it is your first time joining us, uh, my name is Joe Perry. I am the wine buyer here at the Oak Barrel, our little uh, little independent bottle store here in Sydney's CBD. Um, to my right is, is Scott Fitzsimons, um, handling much the same in the, the spirits category of the store. Um, but yeah, as, as we sort of very briefly skipped over at the start there, this is a, this is a little it's a little concept we came up with a, a, about eight weeks ago. It, it would so happen that uh, we would sort of, we would always be here at the store, you know, for the next half hour, hour, hour and a half after closing, um, as what we thought was quite important for, for our jobs to be able to sit down with a bit more of a clear head and taste through products and discuss with one another and um, kind of get a, get an idea of each other's palates a little bit more so on, on different products um, as part of the sort of tasting regime that um, most, nearly all products went through um, that come here into the Oak Barrel. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically the, the, the gist of it, along with all the other uh, tangents and chats that, that we go off on from time to time. Um, but Scotty, here you're feeling fantastic. Yeah, Joey, struggling <laughs> a little bit today. Um, I get sick uh, every Easter, yeah. um, either the week before or the week after, like, like clockwork. And then normally in sort of the first week of December, I get a little bit of the old, the old sniffles, but they just fight through it. Got it, got it this weekend and <laughs> thought I was, was done with it, but um, it has sort of caught up with me a little bit. So in terms of tasting notes tonight, um, you're going to be doing a little bit of the heavy lifting, I think. That, that's all right. I can, I can uh, throw the old tasting note around. I think if, um, if anyone did need any conclusive evidence that wine is the superior product here in the store, I've been doing nothing but drinking wine all weekend. Scott hasn't drunk at all all weekend, yeah. and I feel great. Um, I tell you what, I am looking forward to my first drink since <laughs> Friday night, about this time Friday night as well. So, um, no, no, I'm actually actually uh, feeling all right. This morning was was pretty average, but I'm a big believer in that uh, action and motion makes sickness go just, away. Just keep going. If, if you're not feeling good, get out and kick a footy around, and yeah. <laughs> or lift some boxes out the back of the oak barrel. We're happy to offer that as a yeah, as a if, health if, service. If anybody want to. Um, but yeah, so so I think I think that's just about it. I mean, I just got to give. How are you of, feeling, Joey? I am feeling great, actually. I, uh, I had a very lovely, relaxing weekend full of cricket and some good food, lots of good wine, um, extending into today, which which was good as well. Um, and then yeah, came on down here. So it's been good. I've been enjoying the sunshine. I think we're due for a bit of thunder tonight. Yeah, we just just, know, just the, just the had boys a bit out west got some blow through. Well needed rain, which was good. Um, but yeah, get a Sean. Get a Sean right, Burgess. Mate. Yeah, so we we are live tonight uh, on the on Facebook. So if you have any questions or comments about anything, if we're talking rubbish, make something wrong, or have any more questions, feel free to jump on there and uh, and let us know because we'll we'll be monitoring that, um, which is good. But yeah, this is very much what we we've got up tonight. So what we uh, probably for the first little bit, uh, we will go through some wine. Um, Joey is. I did say big bold flavors is what I want to sort of cut through tonight, so we're going to go that way. Uh, then probably in the second half of tonight, the second half an hour, we'll get into some Tasmanian whiskey samples, um, some stuff that we have in store, and some stuff that has been sent to us in hope of getting into the store or, or getting some feedback. Um, so we haven't tried any of it yet, so you're going to be with us to, to try that along the way um, as we do that. I do like Tasmanian whiskey, actually. I like a lot of things about Tasmania, <laughs> to be fair. Even they make even some, you know, decent wine when they're not making whiskey. That's true. That's and really e true. even better when they've got some wine and they're bored, they make brandy out of it, which is a genius. Oh, what could be better? Um, but yeah, I think we've jumped into the first wine. What do you reckon? Let's do it. I think, uh, yeah, pretty much hit that one on the head without uh, realizing it. It's got even big, bold flavors. Um, g'day, g'day, Danielle. Hope you got some uh, some rain out there today. When I actually look, looked up the rain radar, when I could feel we were about to get hit. It was pouring down over Dunny Doo. So yeah, right. That was a good result. Oh, so I don't awesome. know if it got as far down to you, Danielle, but hopefully it did. Beautiful. Um, but yeah, I think um, just sort of tracing back, I mean, obviously um, we get a lot of product, a lot of wines, a lot of whiskeys and that sort of thing through here. And we've always sort of prided ourselves on finding the new small producer or the new next thing that's kind of going to just come out and it's really going to like, you know, shake the world up and... Hopefully we, we get a chance to, to kind of see it and come through. And I was uh, I was showing this wine about 
three weeks ago, I reckon, um, from a good friend of mine, Dan Simmons, at Grafted Wines, um, who we know now. Um, and, you know, he's, he sort of pulled these wines out, and I spent a lot of time on the internet, you know, on, on social media, trying to keep up, keep up with things that are going on. And we sort of pulled these wines out. I'd never seen them before. It's just going to call me, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, this is, um, what, what's, what's it called again? And he's like, oh, this is, this is Popplevi. Um, pronounced and I go, oh, okay, that's why I don't know what it is because it's something obscure out of some area of Europe. And he goes, no, it's actually um, Estonia's finest. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, no, it's based in uh, it's based in McLaren Vale. And I was like, oh, right, okay. And like just started up first vintage. No, it's been around since about 2016, I think, first vintage for this. Um, and I was like, oh, right, okay, never really heard of it. He goes, yeah, I know, not, not many people have it. Oh, great, okay. And, you know, it, it does strike as quite a, you know, an attractive bottling type thing. It's, you know, eye-catching and... Um, Kill that for a yeah, second so we can Eye-catching and it. really jumps out and it, it kind of, I felt a bit like, oh, what, have I heard of this? Or I haven't seen any wine bars, you know, I haven't seen anyone posting on social media about it. I haven't, you know, had anyone tell me about it. Um, and so I think when when Dan bought these wines to me and he was showing these wines to me, it... The story sort of goes that um, Poppelvai, the the uh, the name of the winery, started by a Danish fellow called um, Uffi Dijkman, and I'm sure that's definitely not how you say it. Um, <laughs> I've I've butchered it more than likely, um, but yeah, uh, Danish was working in a bar in Copenhagen. Uh, sorry, wine retailer in uh, Copenhagen for a year, uh, and then left to do vintage in um, the west coast of America. And then sort of came down into Australia in 2012, where he saw um, the Adelaide Hills and McLaren Vale and Brosser and all these areas, and just completely fell in love with it and decided that's where he really, really wanted to make wine. Um, then fast forward to 2016, uh, he was actually able to set up a winery, and I mean winery is probably a flash word for it, but a very big wine making facility like shed um, in a in inside the hill, inside a hill in in McLaren Vale, um, and then he, he went about making it and up until now i'm aware that 95 percent of all of his production which is only about 2,000 cases a year has always gone to either denmark or the united states so he likes to do things the easy way really is, yeah. what, is what you're trying to say yeah but it um but it was quite striking to me that it's you know because the adelaide hills is, is such an amazing community down there with everyone supporting each other's wines and um it was quite odd for me to think that this wine wasn't you know, going past the local restaurants or anything like this, and after tasting it, it was quite a revolution of being like, wow, this is actually really, really good, and it's being produced down there. I think Australia needs more of it, and I'm glad that it's it's thanks to people like Dan that we're actually getting some more of it. Um, but yeah, this so he do, does a range, um, does a rosé, um, does a Chardonnay, does a Cabernet Franc and a Grenache, and a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so the, the Grenache and the Cabernet Franc come in little bottles like this, um, kind of like a, a stubbier sort of style, and... Um, just ultra juicy, really, really fun wines. Um, then my other reason for choosing this wine tonight, Scott, when you said big flavors, and I know that you're quite the Chardonnay fan. Um, That's what they drink in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and I know you like your big, richer, juicier styles of Chardonnay. So I knew that bringing out a wine that looked like this and is most definitely a natural Chardonnay from um, the Adelaide Hills was gonna kind of shake things up a little bit in your mind. Uh, but the, the thing that I like the most about these wines across the range is they're made, you know, super hands off. So minimal intervention, definitely minor touches of sulfur. Um, the reds go into concrete egg. This gets barrel fermented in old oak and then left in there for 11 months. Um, no finding or filtration or, or any products like that. But to me, they taste very clean, which is kind of my reason for throwing this one at you because it's it's all on paper things you probably shouldn't like, but. You know, I, I have to admit, I, things that I very much enjoy. Don't know anything about this, but I did get a little bit excited reading the back label just there, yeah. where you held it up and it said barrel fermented. Yeah. I, as long as I see the word barrel, I'm getting pretty excited about things. Yeah. So, it's I, yeah, I just think it's it's just really really clean, really well made, but still in that lovely energetic, racy style as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You do get that cloudiness from from no filtration. Um, and I, I believe there was only 400 bottles made this year. Oof. Yeah. And of that, we saw less than 
of the production. Yeah, okay. a lot of it is still going to, to Denmark and the United States. So how much did the oak barrel see then if we're seeing, you know... Oh, uh, we a couple of cases. A couple of cases. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. But like I said, it's, Mi- it's minus only... Minus one. Yeah, <laughs> minus one. But it's only been since, uh, you know, Dan's picked up this distribution and is getting it to guys like me that I'm, that gets me very excited. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool. Um, g'day to a few people jumping on the live stream, uh, to, to Johnny, to Olivia, to Matt Bailey. The pens will come out second half. You're jumping the gun a little bit there on pen chat. <laughs> Um, Joey gets angry if we talk about pens during. I don't know how to spell. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, I think the word racy mm. was. I didn't exactly know how I was going to say it, but I think that's a real pertinent thing on the the palate there. It does have that big nose, and it's not when I say big nose, and I mention the word barrel. It's not eighties Australian Chardonnay. Mm. It's not vanilla. Yeah. It's not yeah. you know butter. It's 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 just a, a weight to to the wine and to like a, a voluptuousness of the mm-hmm. of the uh, of the nose. But yeah, it's 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 very um, racy. Yeah, I think you see that. Yeah, like racy and, and kind of driven as well. And I think that's an interesting comment you make about the the eighties Chardonnay that we saw here. Um, that was more the barrel fermentation kind of like the way it's always been described to me is if you're doing a you know a, a stainless steel ferment or a whatever, and then you're adding then you're throwing it into oak, it's just like slapping it on top rather than barrel fermentation where the ferment is actually in contact with oak at the time. So there's that, that further integration. Right, okay. So that get kind of like it almost gets to know the wood better rather than you can always tell those sorts of styles of Chardonnay because there's like fruit but then there's just bang, oak on top. Is that, is that like a, is that a common thing in, in wine, you know, the distinction between stainless and sort of, you know, wood fermentation? Because I know in, in whiskey and in spirits particularly, and I haven't done enough research into this, but I remember years ago when I did look into it, there was a lot of conjecture about stainless steel, particularly in Scotland, Scotch whisky, stainless steel fermenters and sort of Oregon washback pine fermenters. And people had, you know, two of one, two of the other, or all this, all that, or had one Oregon pine. And then when you sort of brushed away the surface, they'd sort of tell you, actually, you know, we just, we had a mind around that's what we use. It doesn't really change too much. Mm-hmm. Is it a big thing in wine? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Like, like polarizingly different. Um, but you, you like the nuances are probably a little bit harder to tell in something like like a variety like Chardonnay where um, oak is quite common, but like you might see oak, you might see barrel fermentation used before the oak aging stage, or then you might see stainless steel ferment then chucked into new oak or, or something of that nature. But if you look at it in something like um, Sauvignon Blanc, so obviously um, Fumé Blanc is that that kind of like pui fumé barrel fumé like that's, that's historic for that sort of style which always gives Sauvignon Blanc that really like um, really kind of like, rust, like rustic very textural style towards it which I mean there's lots of people out there that don't like Sauvignon Blanc but that will love styles like pui fumé or barrel fermented fumé yeah. blanc styles because it's it's nothing like what you see in somewhere like Marlborough which is really fresh fresh bright high acid fruit with no no real finish on it whereas barrel fermenting in wine always gives it like another layer of complexity and another edge towards it but what it does what it does to me in this wine as opposed to those chardonnays is just the oak is so well integrated and balanced with the fruit that neither really dominates you can tell it's 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 spent time in wood but it's really yeah just integrated yeah which i think it's really good going back for a second mount mm-hmm. field there a second and a third maybe um and can I say, I'm really enjoying it. Mm. Might be the fact it's my first drink since Friday night, <laughs> but, you know, uh, Don't let that sway I, I, am, I am quite enjoying it. Is a lot of acid, mm-hmm. Um, mm. which is not something you, again, going back to the, the stereo, you know, typical Australian Chardonnay, even though we've moved a long way away from that in the past five, ten mm. years. But, we, like, that acid, where's, where's that coming from? Is that... So definitely just, just the fruit um, and sort of how it's been treated. I think that... You know, just going going back again to that that old school style of big, fleshy, flappy, low acid styles of Chardonnay that I'd have to do from the oak and then whatever else they put in there to kind of bring that acid down because that's not what people wanted. Yeah. But Chardonnay is still quite a classically acid-driven varietal. If you look at places like Chablis um, or even somewhere up in like Washington, um, that it when left untouched like this and it has to do with the clones and the the vintage and how high the um, how high the the vineyards are like this is from a, a vineyard called mount jagged which i don't want to try and remember off the top of my head but is, is quite high up in the hills for for a, for a chardonnay vineyard and there you're going to see like a lot more sort of racy acidity 
without you know those it just going full ripe to to sugar and and go into that kind of like you know you call it kind of call it, I call it flabby yes because yeah, there's yeah. nothing that's kind of holding it all together yeah no, I know exactly yeah um, and you, like and that's what can kind of happen not only on on the vine but also in the barrel as well is that acid can kind of just drop off um, but as there's no finding or filtration so you're keeping like as much as as, as possibly you can into this wine really giving it all that. Um, the one thing that, that did also really sell me on these wines is like, I, I won't be able to show it on, on camera here, but it's one of those wine labels that like, I just love like that total geek out. I was, I was just about to say, yeah. <laughs> my next question was going to be, and I'm so glad you mentioned the word clone. Yeah. Because. Yeah. So it's uh, like on the back here, like of this wine, uh, you see a lot of wines that come through and there's obviously legit like laws and what you can put on wine labels or what you have to put on wine labels. But it is at the end of the day still quite vague, you know, ABV and mills and where it came from and the vintage. So on the back of this label, I can tell you that the um, the vineyard was uh, called Mount Jagged. The grapes were harvested on the eighth of March. In that growing season, they had five hundred one millimeters of rainfall. Uh, the uh, ABV is twelve point eight percent. The pH is three point three four. The tartaric acid is seven point zero nine. Now this like won't mean much to a lot of people. Like even sort of me, I, I don't know what that tells you about. Um, the clone is G9, G9V7, which I believe is a burgundy clone. I'm not, I'm not too sure. Um, and it's unfiltered. And that, like all of that on like, just like on the back of the bottle, like readily available is, is great. Um, we will, we'll, we'll look this up um, okay. and find it. But I, I really like that because even though you say you know, it might not mean a lot of things to a lot of people who don't, you know, worry about pH levels and tartaric mm -hmm. acid levels and, you know, the specific type of clone. When people don't know what necessarily they're looking for yet, mm -hmm. it's good to give as much information as possible. 100%, yeah. We, we're seeing it in rum, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> when we talk about um, did it go through a pot still or a column still? Was the column still continuous or, you know, single shot? Did it, was it matured? It might have been still in Jamaica. What site did it come from? Yeah, did it yeah. spend its time in Jamaica? Did it spend its time maturing somewhere else? What sort of barrel? Did it have dosage in it? No one knows what to ask for in rum. So really great producers are going, here is everything from ester levels and high volatile levels yeah. through to where it was matured. And you can figure out what you want to know. And then hopefully down the track, maybe we'll see everything have a TA or, yeah. or something like that. And even if it's just one of those things that registers in like next year you get a a 2019, maybe from a different producer from the same region, and go, oh, man, it was a lot drier that year. That could sort of tell yeah. you something about the thing, that, or the, you know, the clone or, or something like that. Got a few more people jumping in here, and Matt Bailey, who uh, is from the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, who we actually just, I just jumped off watching his stream. Um, he yeah. was talking about Australian whiskies as well, which is going to be great when we get into them. Uh, makes a kind of, it's, it's more of a comment than a question, just saying data overload, mm -hmm. which is maybe a good point as well. I mean, on the front, the front label is very, very clean. You've got a a name of the wine, Manic Pixie Dream mm -hmm. Chardonnay, and a year. But on the back, you have that nerdiness. Do we run the risk of, you know, in in wine and, and this sort of thing, giving like confusing people, and going, the people getting scared and go, oh, hold on, this this is what Matt's described as data overload. I I personally don't think so. Like not as. Not from what I could imagine as a, as a wine consumer, especially because it's it's on the back. It's almost like a DVD. It's like I don't need to know who the you know co-executive producer of so and so was, but it's there if I need it. If it was on the front and it was quite intrusive, yes, I'd agree. Like if it was, if it kind of took away from that that artwork or that aesthetic, that is probably one of the biggest judging book by its color things in in wine and, and whiskey and that sort of thing. If it took away from the kind of creative element of a, of a label and was just that, then people go, oh, that's that's all I'm staring at or like, is this supposed to mean something? Because on the back and it's kind of like reading the blurb of a, of a wine and kind of like it's if you need to know it's there. Um, but I, I, I don't think that it's it's like that intrusive being where it is. Yeah, and and I, I agree as well. I love the, um, like some of the Armagnacs, which you might be able to see just up there. Um, from the DeRose mm -hmm. stable, you get a vintage where it came from, and then on the neck tag, you can find 
the name of the bloke who picked the grapes yeah, and yeah. who distilled it and the sandy soil. Um, but uh, g'day to, to Alex and Karina and David uh, down in Tassie for, for tuning in. Um, but yeah, Matt, just following up that question, says how much data on a label actually tells you about the wine? Um, I guess that, that's a good point as well, but I think it doesn't necessarily need to. That's what the description, say on an e-commerce website, around it will tell you about what it is. Um, or like a um, you know a, a shop assistant here at the Oak Barrel, but I think it's also the same with generic information. Like we had that Burgundy, 2014 Burgundy, in a few weeks back, hmm. and if you say 2014 Burgundy to a lot of people, they go, yeah, yeah not touching it. Yeah. But this was a really well made wine because it wasn't a classic 2014 Burgundy. Yeah. From a different region, so I said that's a good point that Matt brings up. You know how much. You know what? What is the most important information for a, a wine consumer who doesn't necessarily do this as a day job or as their hobby, but walks in wants to grab a great bottle for twenty or forty or sixty dollars? What's the most important bits of information? So the, I think the most important bit for me, um, or like for the consumers that we see, is obviously I think um, obviously region is massively important. Um, you know, you've you have to have the variety on there. So it's over eighty five percent. Region is, is quite big. I think. I think it, vintages are, are quite important as well that are probably misread a lot of the time, especially for areas like Burgundy and even, even parts in um, of Australia. Um, I think though, in that sort of case, I, I mean, it's probably for me and I know a lot of people, it's probably more the information's there. Thanks. I don't like, yeah, yeah. I can't see it frightening people, but for like what's most important, I think A is, is producer. I think people are going to go for producers that they know first and foremost. Then they're going to go for regions that they know. Then they or they're going to go for regions or varieties that they know. I'd say probably around the same time, um, depending on where it's from and, and what goes best there. Um, ABV I think is a really weird one that I think throws a lot of people, especially in wine. I mean, like people don't want to go too big and or e like even too low. Like I've had people tell me that 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 certain wines are too low in ABV for them. Yeah. That's a really interesting one, actually. I reckon if we were working in the Oak Barrel 20 years ago, ABV would be front and center of our conversation and have people come in and say, I want, you know, XYZ, McLaren Vale, Shiraz, you know, this, you know, thing, I want Jurifs at 16%, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. I can't remember the last time I asked, like, that, or someone asked me or came into a conversation about talking about a bottle of wine where ABV was mentioned, apart from, some real outliers that, yeah, are, that are yeah, crazy, yeah, yeah. but like selling two Shiraz or two Chardonnay to someone, I yeah, haven't had anyone ask me an ABV for months. No, and has it, that gone out of fashion or? Uh, yeah, I think it, it used to be a really big thing, you know. And I think well, I definitely saw it more in restaurants, where like you it obviously wouldn't be on the list. People were going, oh, I don't want to drink a fourteen point five percent Shiraz with a, an entree or something like that. Um, but now I like, I, yeah, I don't think from a from a retail angle, people don't mind too much. Mm. You know, I've had people turn down like reasons that go down to ten and a half percent or anything like that. Um, you know, there is obviously a lot of leeway in the industry that I, I know, and thirteen point five might mean thirteen point five. It might mean something a little higher, a little lower. Um, and it's never, it's never going to happen. But another one that I would really like to see, I mean, it, it almost enforced on a lot of wine labels is. Um, you know, it, you have to write on there if it contains sulfites. Whether if it contains more than fifteen parts of sulfur, it needs to be labelled on there. I want to know the I want to know the amount of sulfur. I want to know it contains how many parts because it could be twenty or it could be two hundred and fifty. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Elia Gray chimes in there. Totally agree. Nobody considers ABV. It's all about flavours or region. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a real last five mm. years, decade thing. Mm -hmm. um, but just following up on the sulfites thing, mm -hmm. I mean, we get asked a, a lot for that because we have that, it's been a big catch call of the natural wine, yeah, yeah. the naked wine, the minimal intervention wine, what do you want to call it, movement. Um, what does that mean? Like, we, if you want to know, you know, above a, well, rather than above a certain amount or below a certain amount, you want to know the exact amount. Mm -hmm. For you as a wine expert, as a wine drinker, what does that mean and what should that be telling people coming and buying wines in terms of the amount of sulfur yeah, in wine yeah well i think it's it would obviously make our lives much easier yeah. um but at the same time i think it would it would definitely tell me about a wine if the winemaker has added sulfur the what the reason for it 
So a lot of a lot of people that I speak, like a lot of, of wines that we deal with will only see like 10, 20, 30 parts added at bottling. And that's can just be a safety thing. You know, a lot of people say they sleep better at night if they, you know, just hit it with 20 parts at bottling and then Because otherwise you know, bottles can explode and do bottles all sorts can explode of things. Or they can turn or especially if you're shipping, you know, that's always been been a big thing. So I think if I saw a wine on it that had uh, you know, below well, under, under 100, it would tell me a lot about the winemaker and, and their decision um, as to, to why it went that way. You know, like, would you rather add 50 parts of sulfur or losing 10 entire barrels? Um, but then if I looked at a, a wine and they, they are definitely, definitely out there with up to 200 parts, you know, 250 parts of sulfur, that kind of goes, well, okay, this, this wine was made like for mass consumption and was made to taste a certain way and was made to be a certain way and I don't think that the the vintage or the the vineyard or you know the the tour of it was really taken into account because if you're adding 250 parts of sulfur what else are you adding yeah whereas I think if you're adding like minimal sulfur this minimal use it doesn't actually specify how much sulfur is in here um but you would know it might just be that thing that was just like my wine is it's it's done. It's it's fermented. It's run. It's like it's it's ready. Just hit it with that, and it will be safe on shelves. I, out there. I know. In Korea, I forget. I think it's Sweden that has not on the bottles, but on every label, has the um, sugar content on there. Yeah, it, right. Because it's all, mm. um, you know. I, I think it's Sweden. Correct me if I'm wrong. Facebook massive. Um, in terms of their like all their their pricing levels, so people know the sugar content on, on every wine. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere in the world that does sulfur that way or? No, 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 not yet. There are people that will go out and put the amount of sulfur on their wines, but it's not like, it's not law. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think this is maybe another one of those topics we put in the bundle of. Yeah, it's gonna ne take whole. <laughs> next year when we plan to have a few guests on yeah. this, this show, mm -hmm. when it's not crazy, crazy period, mm -hmm. we'll get some, I'll, I'll step out. <laughs> Maybe you get some <laughs> some winemakers in, uh, and you can you can talk about take this. your bag of sulfur and yeah, leave. Yeah. yeah, I'll just I'll just sprinkle sulfur <laughs> around in in the background there, like the sulfur fairy. Um, but final thoughts, anyway, on the, on the wine. Um, yeah, I think it's really really cool. Mm. Um, love love that this has given enough points on the back label, like even aside from the tasting mm. notes, uh, so the, the the wine itself, enough conversation points on the back of the label, which I think is mm. really important. Um, and whether you're you're sitting here like us talking talking rubbish, or at, yeah. a, at a dinner party, or at a restaurant, or wherever. Um, but yeah, I, as you sort of mentioned, I'm an apologist for the the big yeah, yeah, dirty yeah. Chardonnays. I came from I came from wine via spirits and particularly whiskey. So when I got into things, what I was looking for, I was looking for familiar flavors and concepts. And oak was a big one of them. Mm. So when I got some of those big oaky Chardonnays, I was like, great, I'm home. Mm. This is this is where I need to be. Um, so I'm a big big fan of that sort of stuff. But I, I really like the how the acid holds this mm -hmm. all together. And yeah, it seems like, especially on the nose, like it's it's so like, like big and loud. Yeah, and it seems like you're kind of like, oh, what am I in for here? Could it, it could really go either way? It could yeah. just be like a complete, you know, fruit bomb, or it could be an oak bomb, or it could just be anything. And I think that that really balanced acidity just just brings everything together yeah. really well. And there's a lot going on. Mm. You know, there's there's there a bit is, of yeah. sweetness as well. There's like almost a bit of nuttiness as well mm. right at the end. Um, That's actually not very quick. Another thing that. Um, a lot in about barrel fermentation barrels in general um, is that they are porous and can allow like hints of oxidization like they'll you'll see in a lot of Chardonnay and Sauvignon that's produced in the Jura with the um, uh, extended barrel aging and, and um, oxygen being allowed into the barrels to give it that hint of nuttiness as well so I think that's probably where that comes from yeah awesome mm -hmm. so um, this is relatively new in store, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, how much does this go for, roughly? Uh, I want to say it's about thirty-seven dollars. Thirty-seven dollars. Yeah. So we're talking sort of thirty-three each for mm. members, sort of around a thirty thirty mark for members in a six pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's not crazy, but I think that's that's a very very interesting. Like, I think given the the foreign nature of the name, yeah. If you put a France or something logo or Product of France, mm. you could flog it for double the price. But yeah, but, um, I'm I'm very happy to um now that we're we're starting to see this kind of break our break our markets now from um, the little shed in South Australia, and you know Denmark and the States aren't getting all of it. Yeah, yeah, tasty little one. I think it's very very good. Mm. Um, we're about at the halfway point, and Gary 
um, who comes up for the Whiskey Fair each year from oh, Tasmania, yeah. g'day, g'day. Has, has popped into the, to the chat. So g'day Gary, how you doing? Just in time, and Dylan Whipper as well, who might have been here for a little while, but um, just in time to get on some, some Tassie whiskies, Tassie which whiskies. is what I wanted to do tonight um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, a, there's, there's a very, quite a special whiskey that I, I wanted to try um, uh, or sort of share, share with you because it tells a lot about where Tassie whiskey, I think, is, is going and um, and what exactly is going in the Tassie industry uh, from uh, the point of view of someone like myself who doesn't live in Tasmania. And excuse me while I'm not looking at the camera while I'm trying to uh, also, go things. So the boys um, at Popplevi have actually seen us. Which is good. Is that, a, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I don't know can if you, you see how many pronounced Can you get that yet. Chardonnay heathen off the, <laughs> off the live stream, please? <laughs> um, but yes, so move on to some, some Tassie whiskies. Um, and basically, uh, as Joey said right at the start of the stream, a lot of what we do, what, what this, how this came out of is we would do this anyway, be sitting around. And we're both in the very, very privileged position of being given a lot of opportunities to try a lot of different spirits and wines and, and that sort of thing, um, which is great and I love it. But, and this is going to sound like I'm the, I mean, I am the biggest wanker in the world, this is going to make <laughs> it worse. There's often too much to try. And I have a, there's a table at the back um, of the oak barrel there that is full of samples of uh, a lot of whiskey, a lot of Australian gin, and then a, a smattering of other, other things. And for the low price of $50, We'll let you in. Yeah, let, I open the back door <laughs> for half an hour and let you in. Um, that are sort of that people have sent us to, to try and sample in, you know, the hope that we'll, we'll stock them here at the Oak Barrel. And I think it's a lot to do with the, the Oak Barrel name that um, it's a lot of first points of call for someone in, you know, who wants a foothold in Sydney because you can't go into a, a chain store yeah. and say, hey, can you stock us everywhere? We're independent, we're one outlet, it's it's great. But it does mean that it takes a little bit of time to, to get through it. So, um, I have some very good friends down at a great distillery called the Sheen Estate Distillery in Tasmania. Poltergeist Gin. Poltergeist Gin is uh, one of our best-selling Aussie gins here. Mm -hmm. um, it was on the rotation through, and we're now keeping it pretty pretty steadily. But they make a whiskey called Mackie. And for the past two months, three months, I've had three samples of Mackie sitting here that I have just not got around the chance to drink. And I would be doing them tonight if we didn't have a live stream. So, Joey, if you wouldn't mind, we might sample these three whiskies and see whether it's something we want to stock at the Oak Barrel. Yeah. Um, but before we get on to that, um, I want to do something very quickly that we do stock at the Oak Barrel, um, which I cracked uh, a little while ago, but I thought it was time to, to sort of share with everyone. I finally uh, got it up on the website and all that sort of thing. But this is from, uh, it's called Hobart Whiskey, which is from the Devil's Distillery, just just north of Hobart, about five minutes north in the, in the suburbs there. Um, uh, Dylan chimes in, keen to get into some Aussie whiskey. I've not tried any until a few weeks ago when I visited my parents. I've had a bottle from through called Joadja. Joadja is very, very good. Um, we will be talking about them is great. in the near future. Um, from just uh, sort of south from where we are, we are in uh, New South Wales here, but um, big sherry cast. But um, we're going to focus on Tassie tonight. So Hobart whiskey from a distillery called the Devil's Distillery um, in, in just north of Hobart there in, in the suburbs. Uh, they've done a few things. They did a Tessie Moonshine um, before the whiskey came online. Uh, and one of the things that I've found about Tasmanian whiskey is that uh, five years ago, around this time, I like leading into Christmas, people come in and say, hey, got any of that, you know, Australian whiskey, any of that Tasmanian whiskey? And you go, yeah, I got two bottles mm. and a Starwood. And that was pretty much it. Um, to get five bottles in a row to fill like a, a little box was, was awesome. I've got about... 70 Australian whiskies on the shelf right now. And just by pure fact, the, the market has changed. Um, it was me going out fighting to get to get anyone to sell it to me. It's now sort of getting hit left, right and center with new releases all the time, thinking, do I have space for all of these? Um, and down in Tasmania, it's been a, there's been an influx of distilleries in the past, you know, three or four years in particular. I mean, it's my job to know what's going on. And I used to pride myself on knowing exactly what was going with each distillery and when they were going to release and all that sort of stuff. Now, every time I go down, and I can walk from Gold Bar to the Lark Cellar Door in Hobart there, which is about 200 metres, and I'll trip over new distillers. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, and so 
one of the things that I've found is how do you differentiate yourself as a Tasmanian distillery, particularly in whiskey? Um, and when you look on paper for the Hobart, uh, sorry, the Devil's Distillery, which makes Hobart whiskey, they've got a still that comes from Peter Bailey. They get uh, West, Westminster barley. Um, it's distilled at the, the malting house out of Devonport, whose name escapes me. Um, and all of a sudden, you've got three things that are very, very similar to a lot of us other Tasmanian distilleries and a lot of uh, distilleries on the mainland who have sort of gone in the same mould as your larks mm. and, and those early sort of distilleries. So what makes a difference? How do you stand out? And you can have really great distillers and really great um, processes or we'll change that up a bit. But then the other obvious one is casks. Now, obviously, a pair and tawny casks, the, the words for sherry and port in Australia, uh, there's a lot of them. Uh, you've got a lot of bourbon casks coming into the market as well. But what is a way to sort of go out? We make a lot of wine in this country, so we've seen a lot of red wine and Pinot Noir casks and that sort of thing. This is something completely different that, um, and yes, uh, coming in, uh, Matt Bailey again says some yummy, uh, uh, amazing bourbon casks coming out of Hobart whiskey, and yes, 100%. Um, this is uh, a release we actually introduced Hobart into the to the Oak Barrel crew at Whiskey Fair this year, um, and this was a special release released for um, the the fair. It was bottled about three weeks beforehand, and it started in a bourbon cask, and there's gone into a Sauvignon Blanc botrytis finish cask. Yeah, right. Okay. Now, That's quite unusual. Yeah, very unusual. And Hobart have done a few things with rum casks and rosé washed casks and all that sort of thing. So for me, I wanted to put this in front of you obviously because it's got a bit of a wine aspect, mm -hmm. but it's because something that we're doing that, you know, in Australia, whether it's out of pure experimentation or because distilleries have to, to, to cut through and mm -hmm. let themselves be heard, now there's an influx of them. Um, you know, this is something that the whole world is watching us mm -hmm. going, if, if they can pull this off, we're gonna start doing this mm -hmm. because our whiskey matures a lot quicker. But um, yeah, it was released, there was about 70 bottles in the, in the um, general release we took most of it for whiskey fair mm -hmm. whatever didn't didn't sell on day we sort of kept i think there was a uh, a few dozen that that went through hobart's own mailing list mm -hmm. um but i just the bit that and i don't know if you want to give comments first but there's a couple of things i want to say about no, this really it. quickly when we talk about these crazy casks and particularly wine casks in australia we you know they can be almost like very alcoholic versions of what it whatever else was in it previously mm -hmm. like you throw port so like heavily, you know, sort of whiskey or a high proof whiskey at a pork barrel or sherry barrel or a Pinot Noir cask or a Shiraz cask, you run a real risk, particularly if the barrels are quite small, of getting a very alcoholic port yeah, out of it. Yeah. Which is great if you love port, but I drink whiskey because I love whiskey, you know? And there's some certain, there's some great examples of getting that balance really right. But there's also some balance of getting uh, some things really wrong. Mm. Um, Brie Atwood from uh, Backwoods Distillery down in Yakandanda said, I tried this at the Whiskey Fair and it was three of these, which things three. Well, yeah. What, is, that, is that okay? or? I think so. I mean, it good? depends how, out of how many of these. Yeah. How, how many Brie? Was, yeah. it out of, was it out of three? So was it out of four? Three dash. Yeah. Yeah. Not too <laughs> sure. Anyway, so what I love about this whiskey, and it's, as soon as I opened it the first time and going back to it just now, um, it's been open for about two months, this little sample bottle. Barley is the first thing you get mm -hmm, yeah. off the nose. It's barley, it's whiskey, and that is very exciting for me. Mm. Um, for me, I haven't had taken a sip yet. You do get a bit of sweetness on the palate. It's a little bit floral and there's a bit of caramel um, sort of toffiness at the end. That, and it's you know that it's been thrown at a cast that mm -hmm. something is a bit unusual. Um, but Bree says it was very good. So we're going to say three out of... At mm. least, at least four, three, three out of three, three out of three and a half. One hundred Parker points. Yeah, hundred yeah. Parker points from Brie. <laughs> um, but I just thought, like, a really mm. great example of doing something a little bit different, but not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. And yeah. just you know, what's that old saying? You open your mind so much, your brain falls out. Yeah, yeah. Um, just a really great whiskey. Yeah, I think I, I think that's like a, a really good way to put it is that it's still whiskey. Mm without being, you know, taken into all these crazy new places and kind of forgetting about, you know, where the where the benchmark is. Um, I think it's interesting, like, looking at, at cask use in, in whiskey, which is obviously somewhat foreign to me, and obviously port makes a lot of sense, sherry makes a lot of sense, and then we're even now seeing, um, like, Hermitage casks. Yeah. You know, you know, Syrah casks and Grenache casks, I'm pretty sure have come through at some point. Yeah, it's from the um, G&M Kalila release yeah. that we got on the shelf at the moment. Yeah. 
And, you know, obviously now we see Botrytis Sav Blanc, which is a, what I assume to be, well, what I, I think is definitely a, a sweeter Sauvignon Blanc that's that's been put, um, made in that in that cast there. And I don't know too much about it, but like you don't see a lot of Riesling casks. You don't see a lot of Chardonnay casks. Oh. We've seen a couple. Yeah. And there's a distillery out of Scotland called Glen Murray. It looks yeah, like right. Glen, looks like Glen Moray, M O R A Y on, on mm. the on the bottle, but Glen Murray is how it's pronounced. And they used to do, and I, I obviously haven't tried it for a couple of years, but it was a great national chain store, the supermarket stores, mm. fifty or sixty bucks single malt, and it was bang. It wasn't by certainly not and the most complex in thing. White wine casks, Chardonnay casks. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, what is kind of the? I'm wondering what it takes for what's previously been in that cask to really make its mark in order to then impact a, a whiskey yeah you know like is it because you talk about beer casks now right yeah 100 so, yeah. percent. and yeah just very quickly um uh elliot says there's a cognac called gallus which was matured in aussie dessert wine cask yes 100 yeah. percent. so that was actually um noble noble one which is lindemans de borley de, de borley yeah, yeah noble yeah. one and noble rot by that they which we actually had the gentleman whose name i forget i'm very sorry from gallus we didn't speak a lot of English, mm. spoke a lot of French, but not a lot of English, yeah. do a tasting out there with those releases. They were exclusive to mm. Australia, actually. They sent the cast over there. Um, and uh, D- Dylan says, um, are these, what's the, the makeup of these? these? These are single malt releases, essentially. Mm. Double distilled through a Peter Bailey copper still is, is all the Hobart stuff. Starts in bourbon, finished in Sauvignon Blanc Botrytis cask. Um, but getting back to, to your question, I think what we've seen a lot of big red wine mm-hmm. is because sherry, and port, yeah. they're, they're fortified red wines, yeah. and that's sort of a, a similarity. They have that sweetness to them uh, that has that has sort of worked. And when you see, uh, you know, over, over, even overseas, sort of like Taiwan and, and Japan, like the Yamazaki Distillers Reserved is is a wine cast finish. It's in French red wine barrels yeah, that yeah. Suntory owned the wineries for. The the Vino Barrique from uh, Cavalan mm-hmm. is is red wine mm-hmm. because that's sort of the mindset we know we're going to get that sweetness and, and the other thing is the color as well yeah, color yeah for you know for big companies color still plays a part in selling bottles of whiskey um this sort of thing rosé which they've also done you know Sauvignon botrytis casks mm-hmm. chardonnay casks um I, yeah, I can't think of a riesling cask i don't know if anyone has seen a riesling barrel aged whiskey I we think don't, there's we don't, a lot of riesling that goes into barrels yeah, 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 yeah that's, that's the other thing but um, I just, I'm wondering, like, I'm, I would be really interested to know the science behind what allows certain grape varietals to have an impact on, on oak so much so that it can then have an influence on the whiskey after. Yeah. So obviously right. you see sugar in, in botrytis and fortified, and then you see tannin and reds and yeah. colour. I, I also think it's the time mm. which which plays a big part. Um, and it's, it's not a, honestly something I think people think too much about. Yeah. Particularly from a consumer point of view. Um, in terms of uh, you know how long and the you know residual sugar levels mm-hmm. and the the chardonnay the you know going back to here the tartaric acid that was yeah, in your yeah, chardonnay yeah. that went into the barrel um and you know maybe that's getting to the point where we are going way too far down the rabbit mm-hmm. hole that we're opening our heads too much that the brain falls out um but yeah i think it's experimentation and why i honestly believe and i got pretty good you know examples to back this up by when people from scotland and scottish distilleries and companies come through here there's a lot of people from those old world whiskey producing markets looking at places like Australia and Taiwan mm. and India and Japan because our juice matures very, very quickly. Right. It sucks that we have that climate that these barrels just cook. These whiskies, they expand and contract so quickly that our idea right now, a Sauvignon Blanc Petritus finish in, you know, after a couple of years in bourbon is ready. It's done. Yeah. We're drinking it. In Scotland, that's a 10 year yeah, yeah. project. Mm. So why not look at what we're doing, mm. see what works, and then try and figure it out there. And I, I, I've always found it quite interesting. Um, is it uh, Green Spot that ha- that specifies the name of the winery? Yep. On their things, so they've done Lever Baton and Sasakaya. Ah, uh, yep, yep. I well. think there's Sasakaya. Another one as well. So I, I, that I think is quite interesting because it is. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a funny thing. Like one of my favourite whiskies of all time. Um, was from the Springbank Distillery. Mm. It was a, a Long Row, which is their mm. double distilled, heavily peated um, expression from that distillery. They also do uh, their own name, which is lightly peated and a little bit over two times distilled in Hazelburn, mm-hmm. which is unpeated and triple distilled. And they got these casks from Gaia Barolo. 
Yeah, right, okay, yeah. And the long burn, uh, the long um, long run release was unbelievable. Um, I drank all the bottles I had, unfortunately, but they were unbelievable. Yeah. And then they went on to Springbank, and all of a sudden they were called Barolo casks. Yeah, and right. And then the Hasbro yeah. release was Barolo yeah. casks. So I think, unless you've got like ironclad, mm-hmm. you know, deals with people, um, and Green Spot is is Middleton, which mm-hmm. is Pernod Ricard, which is yeah. quite a quite a big company. Um, they can probably lock that down. But I'm pretty sure that Gaia Barolo, as soon as that release came out from Springbank, got a bit of the old yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on the door. Hey, sell us your cask because you know they're they're a decent Barolo producer. They, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> To put it for lightly, yeah. So I think a lot of wineries um, are quite careful about, mm. and also just like the independent bottlings thing, I can buy you know a cask of Lafroig or whatever, throw it into Sauvignon Blanc Petritus finish, or you know some cask that just matches horrendously with it. Yeah. Put on the shelf of the oak barrel as Lafroig and yeah. ruin their name. So I think wineries feel the same way a little bit. Totally, yeah. About that. Mm. Um, a few comments coming through here. Um, Age of cask and time of aging, the wine would affect it. Mm-hmm. Uh, ooh, sorry. Uh, New Oak plus 18 months of wine kind of would chill return. Big flavor and color for sure. Elliot, mm-hmm. yes, 100%. Um, but I mean, like, you know, you look at uh, Spain right now and you see from the Edgerton Group on your Highland Park and Macallan bottles, you see words like sherry season casks because mm-hmm. they're spending between 12 and 36 months um, seasoning sherry into these barrels where old school, it would be a number of years yep. um, in sherry. So. Definitely a conversation, you know. Now that wood shortages are certainly happening. Um, so what, what what is one of the what is one of the few sort of facts that you would love to see enforced on whiskey on 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 the label? On the label, getting throwing my own medicine back at me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to see where it was distilled. Okay. I think that that's a big thing. Um, even though that seems quite obvious mm-hmm. in in single malt, um, even in like a blend. Yeah, if you buy a bottle of Shivers Regal or Johnny Walker or, or a high-end blend, I would like to see where it was distilled. Um, the independent bottlers who you know have to release a whiskey called the Unnamed Orkney mm-hmm. or a single yeah, malt from yeah. Isla. Um, it, it's a tough one because sometimes they're excellent and they're really great examples of, say, an Isla whiskey that doesn't want its name out there unless they bottle them themselves. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a bit of a tough one. I don't really know how to get around that. But like in markets like Australia, where you see, and you know, we're going to come into it now, we're seeing a lot of brands come to the market and more are coming um, next year and moving forward, where it might be a, a brand name whiskey, but you don't know exactly where it, it comes from. Yeah, I would like to okay, see, right, right. first and foremost, which distillery um, did it did it come from? Um, chill filtration, I, I think chill filtration probably is below added coloring okay. I'd, I'd like to see the word and we don't do you know 99.9 percent we don't do added coloring in australia mm-hmm. but in terms of scotch whiskey and bourbon whiskey i'd like to see if uh, e150 is labeled um that's um that's i think that that's a big thing um matt bailey chimes in there it's definitely a wood shortage not a sherry shortage no exactly mm. um the one of the the great lines that gets thrown around in terms of sherry cask whiskey is uh in terms of marketing guff from a lot of distilleries is yeah only the finest and the best sherry casks in the world are used to mature our whiskey which is bullshit because the best and finest sherry casks in the world are used to make sherry and they've been in the the solera systems there for 60 years 100 years and they're used to make sherry moving forward what is correct is the best and the finest sherry casks that they would sell us yeah. have, they've used to make this whiskey and i think that's the important thing to remember mm. it's only there was a release from aaron uh, when we had mariana romello mm. from the aaron distillery here a few months ago that uh, we, we did a release where a special release where they just tripped over a dagger that was breaking down a, a, mm. a, a solera system and offered it to them and so yes in that case some of the best sherry casks were used um but yeah yeah, um, like I didn't get it initially, but this is kind of really coming into like this ultra white flowery little. It's very floral, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. like real, like lovely like like blue fruits and because like initially you said it was all barley, but now I think it's it's showing yeah. like this love like this elegance. Yeah, and that's sort of my point was mm. you know it's barley, you know it's whiskey mm. at the start, but you know there's something else going on which is not yeah, yeah. typically whiskey yeah. at the end. Um, question uh, or sorry, comment here. Um, uh, from Elliot says, what about the name of the maker on the label? The guy or the girl who made it is a one person or a team. I don't think that's as necessary because um, 
you know, when you sort of turn the, you talk about the maker, and we're, not, we're talking about very small craft whiskey here, but in terms of like the bigger scope of things, you've got a different brewer to a different maltster, probably depending on which distiller you are, to a different distiller potentially who expertise in their own levels, um, to a different farmer. You know, and the one thing I didn't say was where the barley is grown, um, you know, or, or the, the grain, whatever grain it might be. Um, I think that can be a really, or, or could be a really confusing and convoluted mm. way to get around things. Um, I mean, if we, and there's been some conversation around this, do we need to grow the barley in Australia to call it Australian single malt whiskey? It's like, absolutely not, because then almost all of Scotch becomes not Scotch. Yeah. I mean, can someone please go and find all the, the, the miles and miles of Japanese barley fields that are, that are growing out there? No, of course not. They they're all importing it from the, the Benelux, which a lot of the Scottish are as well. So I think there's a difference between, similar to the wine, when you've got this information and you've got it hand and you can pinpoint it to one, mm. to offer it and say, yes, like I can tell you where this was grown, I can tell you who made it. In that case, it's up to the producer and the distiller. I think that's a, that'd be a smart onus to take on yourself and go, mm. we can tell you this information. In terms of going the other way and making it um, compulsory, I think it could be a little bit problematic. But just those... Um, there's a couple of production methods I think would be would be quite good. Um, should we move on to some brand new things? For sure. Yeah. So yeah, this is. This has been great. Um, so I'm nice very excited. Whiskey, this thing. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. I think I've got about five bottles left mm. from from our allocation. Um, I probably should have looked this up before I jumped on here, but I think it was about 71, 74 bottles came right, out of the right. out of the little finishing cask. Um, so we have three whiskies here. All from the Sheen Estate, which is a beautiful estate <coughs> um, in Tasmania, about an hour or two hours north of north of Hobart. Um, and basically, these are all little samples. I believe all three of these whiskies are on the market right now. But uh, I have we've got outside of tonight tastings on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it's been too long me putting this off to, to try this, so I thought, you know, let's do it. Let's do it live, for for better or worse. So we got released two, three, and four from the Mackey, or sorry, Mackey whiskey from the Sheen Estate Distillery. Now, I know a little bit of detail, and I'll tell you the detail on, on this before we um, get started. But the first thing, and the, the probably the most um, important thing to know about all the Mackey whiskies is they are triple distilled. Okay, so, so what does that mean to me? So they are going, so when you you get your, your, your wash, basically your beer that you've brewed to make your whiskey, mm -hmm. chuck it into a copper pot still, and you distill it through, and copper's a great stripping agent. Uh, when you go through once, great. Then you put it in again, go through a second time through that same still, that's when you're running off at about 70% alcohol, you cut it down to 63.5, but copper strips flavors away, strips heavy flavors and what we consider negative flavors away. By doing that a third time, you're purifying even further. So a lot of people will say, um, Talita Alves, Tuesday tasting, which one is that? Um, Talita, I hope you know because you're going to be here hosting that one. Um, but yes, got Glendronic tasting on tomorrow night doing the single casks. And if you want to come and you don't have a ticket, I'm very sorry, but there is physically no more booze. <laughs> I have a waiting list of about 20 people and no more days left in the year. Um, but g'day to, to Rowan, Steve and Daniel for, for choosing in. But, but back to, to Sheen Estate very quickly. Um, that triple distillation um, will give you further purification. Now, if you did 90 distillations, what you'd get is vodka. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's how you, that's how you make vodka, putting a lot of copper plates into a column still to clear all the flavour out to make it a neutral spirit. So going triple, it's done in a couple of places in Scotland. We mentioned it earlier with Hazelburn out of Springbank, mm -hmm. have a line, Ockentoshin, do triple distillation. There's a few new ones coming up, trialing it with it. Um, it is generally, a lot of the Irish do do it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It gets rolled out, or used to get rolled out. So what's the biggest difference between Irish and Scottish whiskey is Irish distilled three yeah, times, yeah. Scottish distilled twice. Rubbish, a lot of Irish distilled twice, a lot of Scottish distilled three times. But it's that it should give you that lighter flavor. Right, right. But there's a lot of other factors to come into this. So, I have known, heard a lot about Mackie over the years. I've never actually tried one properly. I've tried yeah. a couple at the end of trade tastings down in Tassie. But, um, yeah. So, I guess what, what the purpose of this is, is this, we're not trying to sell you anything here, but give you a window into what we're looking for when we are looking at new spirits. Um, and there's also, I don't know 
I can tell you that this is release two from Mackie. It's 49% ABV, triple distilled. Um, it's been matured in French oak casks, um, which were from N Grand Bur X Grand Burge, okay. um, which were tawny casks, which is essentially Australian port. Right. Um, now, there's a couple of other factors that would come into this and will come into this when we sit down in terms of price and, and that sort of thing. But I think the biggest thing that we consider now is I have shelves and shelves of Australian whiskey. Mm. If I have no more space for Australian whiskey, what comes off that this goes yeah. on in place and, and that sort of conversation. But for me, I think it's it's the oak that jumps out of this. Yeah. There's a bit of spice, a bit of tannin right off the nose. But sweet. Sweet. Uh, Doran, yes, Mac Mackie from Sheen is exactly what we're trying. Um, I should probably put that up on the old thing. Um, first impressions, Joey? Yeah, like, I come go with that. I get a lot of, um, I see a lot, a lot of oak, a lot of sweetness, a lot of sort of biscuitiness, a lot of nuttiness in there. Um, it's got that kind of like real cooked dark fruit element towards it. Um, all sorts of just just like lots of baking spice, lots of clove, yeah. lots of cinnamon. Um, what's the ABV? 49. Forty nine. Uh, yeah, forty nine. Forty nine across the range. Hmm. Which I, I actually quite like. I mean, people sort of we do get asked a lot of the time about why car strength, why forty three, mm. why forty six, and my ideal drinking level I've found up probably on average. Sometimes you dip below, sometimes you dip higher. Is somewhere between forty six to, to fifty. Mm -hmm. It's about the forty eight mark that I tend to love whiskies. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not gonna. Mm. I didn't bring out for pets because I wanted to drink this as forty nine. Yeah, they've obviously chosen that for a reason. Yeah, all that like all that like it just kind of got it's got that like baked goods sitting on the counter kind of thing happening mm. you know not like intense intense spice but just very aromatic and i find like the nose is almost um uh, uh it's, it's got this illusion of dryness mm. from the spice mm. that the the finish is, is is i wouldn't say particularly dry at all and i was going to say that this you know probably comes from slightly smaller casks probably like underneath 100 litres mm -hmm. in size just because of it's picking up so much of that spice but um, yeah the, the finish is it's got that that softness to it yeah lots of lots of lots of that um, that sweeter fruit that you were talking about as well yeah it's got that got that sort of that's that sweeter fruit um, Elliot uh, says, with a drop of water or not, um, normally what we would do is put a drop of water with this, but um, we're already at a lot of time, but yeah. we're going to keep going, so we probably won't um, drop and water. To be fair, most of our, well, all of the after work whiskey tastings that we go through always get tasted neat yeah. beforehand. Yeah. So. I mean, de definitely neat first. I think there's a, an element for me of, you can release a, a single cast, cast strength whiskey, and that's great because that cask was singing, mm. um, and with water it might even get better. But I think if you if it doesn't work out of the bottle, mm -hmm. then why didn't you change it to where it does? Yeah, you know, there's. Um, I remember that the lark we bottled in the um, hundred mil bottlings a couple of years ago, which was a um, in a small cast bourbon finish, and we went through the whole levels of um, fifty eight percent. So it was either going to be bottled forty three or fifty eight percent, and it sung at about fifty, um, and it was really good at fifty eight was a bit messy around the 52, mm. 53, sung at about 50, um, and it was really good at 43 again. Mm. But it was about giving people the option. Mm -hmm. And if it was good enough, then we, we could do it. But if it was rubbish at 40, uh, 58, absolutely would have done it at 43. You know, when you buy a bottle of whiskey, you should be able to drink it as is, mm. you know. And they've obviously bottled these at 49, so we're going to take them as is for, for this, this purpose. A lot of that, like, that sort of almost like chewy tannin-like character as well. Just right on the mid palate. It is quite chewy, yeah. Yeah. So um, for those asking, we are on uh, release number two, which is a, a French oak uh, tawny cask from from the Sheen Estate Distillery, um, called Mackie Whiskey. Now I, I don't, I purposely didn't do a, a huge amount of research. Mm -hmm. I've been to the distillery. I, was, I lie. I've been to the site yeah. before before the distillery was really set touch, up there. Touch the ground. Touch the ground. Yeah. Touch the old. Uh, Colonial buildings, beautiful, yeah. beautiful part of the world. If um, if you need someone to get married and find yourself in Tasmania, <laughs> I reckon Sheen Estate is probably not the, the worst option you could have. Um, 
but I did not do too much research on these because I wanted to try them as they are mm -hmm. to see um, um, to, because this is basically how we choose whiskies and, and spirits mm. to go on the shelf so mm. now there's the water well, um, which is normally only here for uh, decoration <laughs> purposes we're going to give it's it a use tonight Mm. Uh, so now we're going to move on to... And so these have all been made differently? Um, in terms of uh, production, in terms of distillation, they're all triple distilled. Right. Um, they're all using um, they're using barley from the same place. Mm. The, and again, I'm going just based off the label. I haven't done any research beyond what I already knew. Right. So we're going from a French oak um, a port cask or tawny into a French oak. Uh, number three okay. is a pear up. Then we'll go into another um, 20 cask mm -hmm. at the end. Now, I think one of the things I should mention here as well is I really hate talking about and reviewing early releases from a distillery because it really should be the worst whiskey you ever make. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Uh, just like, just like wine, like anything. Like the first time I paint a picture, or you know, mm. make a, a a wooden coffee table. I should always be learning, always be getting better. And so early distillations and, you know, your, your wood management policy, everything you learn and ex experience, should you should get better moving forward. You know, Scotland has two, three hundred years worth of distilling history behind them. They know how to do it. Mm. We're largely still learning. Um, so I do, you know, hate to be too critical, but I also um, hate when, not hate, hate's a tough word, but I also, you know, try and educate that, if you try a release from a distillery in Australia that you're not head over heels for, um, you know, there's every chance that it's going to get better because it should. And if your first release is your best ever release, mm. then that's a bit worrying. Yeah. So uh, release number three here from Mackie uh, into the uh, Apericast, which is Australian Sherry. And straight from those, this is different. This is very different. Yeah. It feels like, like much deeper. Yeah. Um, I think the first one really sort of jumped out with its with that oak influence. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, Doran types in uh, toasty, roasty. How about some flavors would be great. <laughs> um, uh, Doran, I, I'm honestly I'm not a huge fan of giving out tasting notes because my tasting notes are going to be very different to to yours. I grew up on a different street to Joey. We were born in different countries. We've grown up in different parts of the world. You grew up on the coast. I grew up in the suburbs. So. My macadamia nut tree, when I look at oils and things, is going to be very different to you know coastal notes and that sort of thing. So in terms of like specific flavors, not not huge on. I'm a big fan of experience and mouthfeel and texture and that sort of thing because I could say, and I've said it many many times, you know, with a lot of the Paul John, you know, six row Indian barley, we get that really um, thick oily whiskey. This is macadamia nut, or this is yeah, sitting some of the Boxing Day test matches on. It's it's drinks breaks yeah. for um. For, for the family and you get out the macadamia nuts and put them in the the the, uh, the gaps in the concrete get your hammer out and crack them out <laughs> and essentially you crack a couple that's what this whiskey is and everyone goes what the hell are you talking about <laughs> so i don't want to go too specific on on tasting notes um but i can do it i just convert everything into wine yeah yeah, yeah. Know, so but yeah i think straight off the nose there's still an element of, of spice and richness there, um, but it's deeper. The sweetness is, yeah. is deeper. Getting a lot more burnt caramel. And yeah, it drags you in. Um, burnt caramel, definitely. Mm. For me, it's, it's more of a toffee note. I don't get that. I mean, again, I am coming off the back end of the cold, so yeah. you might be a little bit more precise than me. Um, it's not as... Um, yeah, I, I don't really get that that burnt note as much mm. I get that that sort of intensity of sweetness yeah I'd, I'd, I'd probably say the same thing it's, it's quite sort of yeah it's much more I guess yeah intense and concentrated rather than the the two which was quite big with its with its baking spice and it's kind of you know rich cinnamon and, and brighter ish roots whereas this yeah. is quite a quite a muscular style I think um, it, it's quite one thing that I'm picking up. I mean, we, we made a bit of a deal about it being triple distilled mm. right at the start, and um, normally you, you're expecting mm. you know a lighter whiskey. I wouldn't necessarily call these whiskeys light. No. Part of the fact is I think that we're, these are both French oak, and French oak 
as opposed to American oak. American oak has got a really nice tight graining to it. It doesn't mm. leak, it doesn't really knot. So you get those beautiful vanillas and honeys and caramels, whereas French oak can give you some spice mm. and can give you bulk. And that's why, so this, this is French oak as well. So I actually think these are quite- Ah, uh, McWilliams. Yeah, so X, X McWilliams mm. tawny cask, uh, sorry, a pair of cask. Um, so I think that's actually quite an interesting little comment here is when you see the word triple distilled, you're immediately going to think lighter. These are bold, big, spicy yeah. whiskies. So you can only you can sort of, or maybe what you're getting at and making it for is if it's a lighter spirit, it's just going to get more of yeah. what you throw at it. And, and these are, I would, funnily enough, these are more traditional whiskey casks mm. as opposed to our Hobart, which yeah. was very untraditional finish. These are far more cask driven than what the, the Hobart was, which is which is neither here nor there in terms of end result. Um, but I, I actually, I'm really enjoying this number three. I think this is really quite smart. Um, I really, um, there's a lot going on here. I think the, you know, it's very front forward whiskey. Yeah. It's a whiskey you'd nose for a long time mm. because there's a bit going on there. The, the, the finish is, um, you know, sort of sort of me, medium length, which is quite typical for Australian mm. whiskies. I don't think we here in Australia have really nailed the long finish of a whiskey yet. Um, I think it partly to do with our climate. They're maturing so, mm. they're maturing, you know, they're getting so much flavor from the yeah, oak yeah. so quickly that you're not always getting the time for the spirit to, to calm down. And maybe that's, you know, something we need to work on in the next 20 years and think about. But I don't get that chewiness that we saw in the first one. Yep. I don't get that kind of like, to me, it's just, it's kind of, it's like really just all up front and it's just like, it, that's everything that you've got. There it is kind of like, um, but yeah, like, like, so, but don't care more honeyed toast kind of thing. It's quite like, um, yeah, I don't get a, a I don't, like, yeah, I don't get a much of, much of that like exotic baking spice. I think it's a little bit more, there's a bit of cardamom. And, I like, I like that. Honey toast Orange thing. jam. There's yeah. there's, there's, there's yeah. no butter or butter or margarine in no, no, no just involved. Honey just and toast, toast yeah. honey yeah. on it. There's a lot of that going on. Mm. And you're just rich. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh yeah, I, I I do sort of understand. I think you know there was probably a bigger palette on mm. release number two than to to this one release mm. number three, but I think that nose is very very good. Like that, that is just sucking me in. It's got that, yeah, that, yeah. that depth. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah, it's looking really good. A um, couple of comments there. Matt Bailey says, stop using small casks. The end, um, which I, I do, I'm a big fan of um, in terms of moving away from overly small barrels. Which I think is, is happening. There's a commercial element to getting whiskey onto the market. Starting a distillery is a very, very expensive thing to do. It's two years before you can legally call it whiskey. Mm. Whether or not it's worth selling it two years in one yeah, day yeah. is a completely different question. Um, so getting uh, casts out there is, is a real concern. Um, or sort of getting whiskey on the market is, is a real concern for d distillers. Um, but I mean, it, it can be managed. I mean, these are not single cast releases. Uh, these, you know, release two, release three, they're being vetted. I'm assuming, again, I, I don't know the cast, you know, make up or whether they were single cast, they might be single cast, we down to 43. But honestly, this is this is what this process is. Mm. We look for the things we like, then we go, okay, why does it taste like that? What's it gonna cost? Does it fit in the oak barrel mold? Um, that's, that's what's gonna happen. Um, so, um, but yeah, I think once we've, we've got over that hump and I'm seeing a lot of um, distilleries moving away from smaller format in, into bigger formats. Um, but yeah, as I sort of alluded to, uh, Blackgate mm -hmm. did the 520s release, which was 520 uh, yeah, litre yeah, cast, yeah. fed it together, then the 620s. And they saw some barrels halfway through, not halfway through, but sort of like 18 months into the maturing process the second time around, we're getting too hot, we're getting too tannic. So they pulled them out, fatted them across other things and got creative with the way that you can use right, small barrels. Yeah. And I think that works. And there's been a, a 
uh, one distillery, which a Tasmanian distillery I won't name, which I walked into a couple of years ago or last year and saw these 20 litre barrels lined up. Okay, that could be interesting. And they tried it. And then about three months later, as I found out, they ripped them all up and poured it all back into 100 litres. Yeah, right. Okay. They didn't like the way it was going. So yeah. it's going to be um, an interesting way to see how this all works out. Mm. So you don't know how big these barrels are? No idea. No idea. I'm, I'm going to assume they are less than 100 litres um, just because of the, the amount of how... I mean, but having said that, they're triple distilled. It's mm. triple distilled whiskey, so the spirit inherently is lighter. Yeah. So it's going to take on... It doesn't have as much bulk to fight against what was going on mm. um, around it. So, like, you know, uh, someone mentioned Joe Adger on the on the stream before. You know, they're looking to make quite a big spirit because they are using big Pedro Jimenez, right, right. you know, European oak, Spanish Pedro Jimenez barrels. They need bulk in their spirit to fight against it. Yeah, yeah. Whereas this is a little bit more of an open door. It's no barrel, come on in. Let's say good day. We want to have a conversation and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say that any of these necessarily have had, or so the first two have had the Apera or the Tawny go over the top. No, I don't no, think so. I think they're, they're, they're pretty well um, integrated from what they are. Uh, so we're on to uh, release number four now, which is again triple distilled, French oak barrels, ex Grand Burge, uh, Australian tawny port. So, so it's really the same as two. So basically the same makeup as two, and I can see on the nose there's a lot of similarities there. I get that big, that exotic spice thing again. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's kind of like I'm. I'm seeing a little bit more. Um, I don't know if it's sort of going to shake away from just being in that smaller bottle, but a lot of greener notes in there. Like, like there's a, like quite a herbal sort of flavour jumping out at me here. Do you reckon it's herbal or do you reckon it's that, again, that clove spice sort of thing? It's not the... I, I, I don't see a similarity quite like the first one. Okay. I see a little bit more of that, like, that kind of... I mean, I guess you call it exotic herb, but... Um, just a little bit of that cut grass note. Yeah. Which I think is quite interesting. Which is uh, one of my favourite tasting notes of all time. Cut grass? Yep. Yeah. You, see, you see it in Young Linkwood. Uh, yeah. You, you can see it in... Um, Clear Valley Riesling. Yeah. Yeah. And you see it in one of the greatest whiskies of all time, Jamison. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of, like... I remember back in the day before I was working at the Oak Barrel, I um, used to run a company called Dram Club hmm. and we ran these tastings at bars and hmm. every now and again the bar manager would line two whiskies up and think, oh, well, yeah, this, this bloke thinks he knows what he's talking about with whiskey and, and put two whiskies in front of me and see if I could guess which ones they were and I'd fail every time unless it was Jamison. <laughs> could always pick Jamison out of a lineup. Now now that I mix my Jamison with Amaro's and other yeah, various yeah. things around the world, it's a little bit difficult. But, to the um, dark side. Yeah, I, 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 you I, probably I get some cut grass out of Amaro. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Jamison now tastes like mint. And so. <laughs> For me, this is a little bit more subtle than number two. Yeah. It almost feels like... I mean, if you were to put them in terms of like flavour and intensity on the nose, like right in the middle... Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, just like they're they're like there's still that there's still that real lovely sweetness right at the back. Um, yes, Matt Matt Bailey has jumped in with caps saying young linkwood. And yes, it's a very different cut grass note. Mm. But yes, I do get, you know, freshly cut grass off, mm. off young linkwood. And Linkwood being one of my favourite distilleries in Scotland has this bizarre thing. It's a great blender's mod, it binds flavours. And it can be that very, you know, youthful um, green expression when it when it's young, which not everyone likes. Mm. I'm quite partial to. But then when it gets to sort of 15 years and above, we see excellent expressions from Gordon and McPhail and that sort of thing. They do a 15, I think it's a 21 or a 25 they do as well. And it just turns into all elegance. Yeah, right. After that, it all yeah. calms down. But I think mm. you need that vibrancy of that youth mm. to, to get it out there. But yes, young Linkwood, mate. Uh, Marco Grezzo points out Lefroy Quarter Cask, Longway Runlets and Kildekins, which was, uh, again, a smaller cask release. Nothing wrong with smaller casks. No, no, 100% agree, Marco. When, but I think you've got you to play to your environment. Mm. You know, you've got to have, not lock yourself into one thing and try everything. And again, I'm speculating here. 
and I could be completely wrong about a lot of things about how these whiskies were made, but this is sort of part of what this live stream has always been about is to giving you guys a window into how we choose what we choose so that you know when you come in here or buy online you know what it is and what our criteria is yeah i don't know it's like a lot of like a lot of green tea still got that like lovely little honey thing but not as much as um what's it three yeah three two three yeah yeah, I, I I think I like this nose the best. Yeah, I, I haven't. Yeah, I haven't gone too deep into the palate on this one, mm. but I'm like I'm still going back to the nose, and I think a lot of that spice is burnt off. I mean, these samples were I haven't tried any of these. These are opened literally as we we're pouring. Mm. So, in tr truth be told, I will go back and first thing in tomorrow I'll probably go back and pour a little bit, mix yeah, with yeah. water, and do this all without the rush. Um, but often, first impressions are the yeah. best ones. Yeah. It's probably how everyone else is drinking them, so. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and, you know, that's the thing. I get a whiskey on the shelf that has been opened yeah. and played with. Oh, yeah, so it was genius after it was opened for exactly 17 yeah, days. Yeah, and yeah. I put five mils of water to 15 <laughs> mils of whiskey in it. It was at 27 degrees outside, but 19 yeah. degrees constant in here, and it was just perfect. No. <laughs> yeah. Open a bottle, pour it into a yeah. glass. I'm going to a barbecue. Or... Has to work, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's funny. I reckon number four is the best put together of it's the It's my favourite. Yeah. I still like number three as a show mm. pony. Yeah. Like that jumped out at yeah he wanted, he wanted yeah. to talk to me I was like yeah. Scott what are you doing let's, let's get into it let's go partying now yeah. are we going clubbing like what's going on whereas I think number four is the the best put together whiskey of the lot I, I, you can just enjoy it because you're still getting different flavours every time you kind of go back to it yeah now I don't, I don't know relative they could all be exactly the same age mm -hmm. they could be mm -hmm matured next to each other they could be matured in different places um honestly don't know i expect and would suggest that a couple of those things are different they're probably slightly different ages or you know in australia we have to consider a three-year-old and a three-year-old mm -hmm. may not be the same thing yeah. because if you've got three-year-old that has three summers and a three-year-old that has two summers mm. they're going to be very different whiskies um so we don't know you know what time and that sort of thing but with everything, specs are great. Flavour, first and foremost, before it gets onto any of these shelves. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think, I, think, I think you might be right there. As much as... And see, uh, here comes in. This is a bit of the black magic. <laughs> so clo close your ears, listeners, who don't work <laughs> in the industry. Um, getting back to our original point of, you know, we're trying these to find out whether we want, we want to stock them. Um, and a bit of the background, as I, we mentioned before, Poltergeist Gin is one of our favorite Australian mm -hmm. gins. We sell a lot of it here. So we know on paper that the Sheen estate know what they're doing. They know that how to put a good product onto the market. Um, I know in my head which one of these I would like to sell mm -hmm. um, and I think is worthy of, of going. And you know, again, going to the back, it's not just put on the oak barrel shelves but at the risk of knocking something else Australian mm. off the shelves which is which is not necessarily a good thing to think about but then I don't know anything about price on mm. these they could be the same price they could be different prices yeah, yeah. Um, I honestly don't know whether all these are still available um, released to I think was a little while ago now so that might be well undone and dusted I think number four is the best whiskey but if we were doing a trade show or whiskey fair or even a counter tasting at the front we were giving customers little quick yeah, yeah you know seven mil samples i reckon we would sell more of number three just because of that jumpy nose yeah but for me i'm going to go back and email david ann kirk who um uh who distill and, and own the, the distillery and i'm going to ask them i think what is the pricing and availability of number four yeah, right. Because while, you know, obviously we've got these samples now, we can give customers noses and that sort of thing. 
I'd want to be more confident on someone getting it home and en- enjoying, the, you know, the longer experience rather than the show pony. Not saying there's anything wrong with this whiskey. I just think this is a touch better. Yeah. In its in its complexity and its development. I think it's definitely like I'd never be one to like try and claim I understood whiskey complexity or development or anything like that. But just in terms of like, it was I found it really interesting, but also really enjoyable. Mm. And it just it really seemed to not like you know sprawl all of its eggs out at once kind of really developed yes yeah and yeah it was just constantly changing which was really cool and that might be the best point yeah because i'm sitting here i'm thinking about cast sizes and mm. what is triple distilled versus double distilled and all that stuff where does it put sit in the, the global world at the end of the day like you say you don't know as much about whiskey mm. production that sort of stuff but you work in a bottle store you drink a lot of whiskey with me you probably know a little bit more than the average punter on whiskey like you certainly do but the average punter just wants something that they can enjoy yeah and a yeah. bottle of whiskey is an investment whether it's 50 bucks yeah. or 500 bucks it's an investment whether it's you know and you want to make sure that 500 or 700 mils whatever it is you know continues mm. to give to you and i think certainly number four um would would, would do that which is a good sign because from our little case study here it means they're getting better yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Their, their, their product is developing, mm. which is always the way it should be. If we went, number two is the standout winner, as much as that would be great, and I'd get on the blower you know, tonight and wake people up in Tasmania and said, send yeah. me as much as you can give me, that would worry me that they're not doing better as, as far as they go along. Um, G'day Crafty, uh, tuning in. There's, a, there's actually been a bit of a, a barrel and strain climate conversation going on in the live stream as we've been talking about Missed this, it, hey? which which is which is great because they're <laughs> replying to each other and yeah, and that, that's good and that's you know that's what this is all about. It's about community and certainly don't take our words for gospel. We're just two fools who like to drink excellent wine and excellent spirits and excellent beer who who are talking through it um, and ha- and having a bit of fun. But I think yeah, that was that was really interesting. And as I said, that was a bit of a window. Normally, I'd spend a little bit. <coughs> excuse me longer time with with all of these joey take over please <laughs> uh yeah so so what scotty was trying to say before he started dying um very slowly um is is yeah i guess his, his, t- his tasting regime uh usually involves a much darker environment and a much later time of night uh, but we're lucky to, to drag him out here and, and sort of take us through that um all together but um but yeah but um and i think that's why there's a backlog because you yeah. know these things have taken a lot of time and a lot of money to produce and you know gins take a lot of time to produce and I feel quite bad sometimes because you get sent all these samples and I just don't want to try them in five minutes and yay or nay yeah yeah, yeah I yeah. mean sometimes you have to that's mm. the nature of it and again I'm not going to deny that I have the greatest job in the world and that's definitely the case I do have <laughs> the greatest job in the world um, but sometimes it just takes a little bit of while to, to get to things and so um, when my only or our only free night out of tastings and mm. clean up and pack up tonight was tonight. With so, well, okay, if that's enough, we're going to do it. We're yeah, yeah. <laughs> on camera or not, we're going to, going to have to do it. It yeah. is good fun though. It's very enjoyable, and you know, we obviously, I, I quite enjoy it because I find myself reaching for things that, they like, I know what I like to drink, and I know what my partner likes to drink, and I know what to take home. Um, so, just go reaching for things that maybe aren't the most common things that I, I see in my household it's a lot of fun too yeah, yeah. Um, one, one question there from uh, from Doran says does the average punter change with within price bracket and I guess that's sort of uh, to, to both of us um, there and uh, yes yeah, yes and no I well, think... I, so what, just just to do with the question does the average like do we see different types of people for different types of price brackets? Is that what that's well, I, I, think, I think I think what he's what he's getting at there is the concept. of What we were saying is, average parties wants to go home and just drink it straight out of the bottle mm-hmm. and enjoy it. Um, but you have people who are really into their whiskies, who you know know as much as us or more than us, and all that sort of thing. They still might only be able to afford a fifty dollar whiskey, mm-hmm. or they might be able to afford a five thousand dollar whiskey. So you get, I think, your average punter in the sense that we're talking about it, is someone who has a day job, who enjoys whiskey, but it's not their life. They might sit at home when they get 
home from work and read up about whiskey and buy whiskey books and watch somebody gets on Facebook. Yeah, well, all the, all the real ones are doing something else. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is just mum and dad times 20 <laughs> watching us at the moment. Um, you know, and they can do that or, you know, people have families, they have other hobbies and that sort of thing and they just want to, you know, trust in a bottle store or a, an online retailer or a bar that they're going to get something good. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what we mean when we say the average punter is that, you know, I don't have time to research this myself. I don't know whether I want a 2018 cave yeah, matured yeah. Chardonnay yeah. or 2019 cave matured Chardonnay. I just want to know that it's good. Um, but then you get people who, you know, probably a lot of people on this live stream here who know a lot, who, who want mm. to know. And so, you know, hopefully that's something that we adapt to at the Oak Barrel and, you know, we don't throw too much information mm-hmm. at someone, but we have the information there if you want to do it, which again, probably, like it's all the way back to a conversation we had started about an hour ago about labeling and information and, and transparency between the consumer. I, I yeah. think that's the most important. Yeah, I think, I think from a wine perspective, um, does the average punter change with price? Definitely. Like I think that there's, for me it's, it's $30. Is kind of like, and I know, like from from purchasing wine before I worked here, it's always been thirty dollars. Is it's, am I having pizza on a Tuesday night and I need a twenty four dollar bottle of Sangiovese, or am I having steaks on a Friday and I need a sixty dollar bottle of Shiraz? But like mindset wise, it's definitely that. Like yeah. there's that, there's that, there's that, there is that bracket of going walking into a store and going, I need to spend X amount. What's the best bottle I can get for this amount? Yeah. And then, you know, like it's, it's almost impossible to take someone from a $20 bottle to a $50 bottle. I, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. But I don't think the conversation necessarily changes. No. Between that $20 bottle and the $50 bottle or, and, you know, spirits, the $70 to the, to the 500 mm. If it's quality, if it's done the right way, if there's transparency on how it was made yeah. and, and why we're excited about it, then that's the same for the average punter, whether they can afford 70 bucks or 500 bucks. Mm, yeah. You know, that's often been the, when we've, you know, between ourselves at night, so like, what is like, what is the oak barrel? Who is the, you know, the target market? We're not gonna try and sell you on price points, but you know, we'll, we'll sell you, we, we love this bottle of whatever it is. And we're gonna tell you the story and sell it to you. And then we'll get to the end and be like, oh, okay, I want that. Okay, mm. well it's X amount. Oh, I can't afford that. Okay, no worries. We'll move on to something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or actually, I was going to spend a little bit more than that. Can you go into that? Um, and that's because that's how I used to shop. Um, you know, when I was in Redfern at, at Vine, I would go to Vine Bottle Store. They'd, you know, sell me a lot of wine down there. And I didn't know a lot about wine back then, again, coming from the spirits. And they would go, Scott, you need to try this, this, this. And I go, great. And how much is it? And they go, 70 bucks. And it's like, yeah, I got ten bucks, <laughs> and I need to eat for the next two days as well. So, how can, how can we distill this down into yeah. a you know thing? But I, I loved that. That's and it wasn't the price consideration about that mm. bottle of goods, but it was all about the story and, and whatever. Um, and then I guess coming back to to um, the the Mackey stuff that we just tried here, I'm not too sure, um, you know, what that price is going to be. Like whether I I can Google and find out what they're selling it for, mm. but that could be a different price to what we're selling it on the oak barrel shelves for. Um, and if we have, if I turn around and see all the Australian whiskey is all sitting in the exact same price point, yeah, yeah, I need exactly. to go, okay, yeah. well, hold on, we need to move through a little bit more of that and find some other stuff mm-hmm. out of there. So it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. And, and yes, um, yeah, you know, um, carrying their groups, have, clubs have, um, you know, 200 and 700, you know, bottle, bottles of whiskey sitting in, in their collections. Um, but I think from, from our point of view is why should whatever we have be the next one? Mm. What is interesting and, uh, you know, production-wise, why is that uh, authentic and transparent and why should we, why should our next bottle of wine or beer or whiskey or tuna or armagnac or whatever be the next one that you add to your collection mm. or probably even more important than adding to your collection, be the one you bring to the barbecue or to the next club meetup to say, hey, this yeah. is pretty special. Yeah, yeah. So that you yeah. can, you know, because essentially that's then on you, you know. I brought this, you know, why is, why is this interesting? So I think it's quite quite an interesting question in terms of, um, you know, 
consumers and, and that sort of thing. And yes, definitely there are people that have 200 and 700 bottles of whiskey and wine. And you know, mm. how many times do we have people that buying wines to just add to the cellar yeah, that, that we have yeah. come through here? Um, but often they are not full time wine or you know spirits workers. They and so they don't physically have the time to to hang around all day and learn about this. And yeah. I, it was actually something I noticed quite when I started working in whiskey full time and spirits full time was that all of a sudden when I was looking up to you know other friends and learning off them I knew a little bit more all of a sudden yeah I actually felt a little yeah. bit bad I was like oh shit how have I done this I was like turn around because it is my day job mm. their day job is to be a band manager or yeah. an accountant or a lawyer or mm. a doctor or whatever they do it's my job to know about this yeah so if, if I walk in and the the band manager and the doctor know more about my products than than I do. Then I'm not doing my job properly. So <laughs> it's a it's it's a funny little little conversation there. But yeah, um, we uh, so just a, a last one from from Daniel Mathers. Good to see you, mate. The pair of Mackie, which is number two, uh, sorry number three, which we tried, um, uh, is incredible. Tried it for the first time at Winter Feast outside in four degrees. Two cold says probably. I was initially impressed. Tried at room temperature in Brisbane. Absolutely stunning. I agree with your assessment of release two. Yeah, I think, um, yeah. Even though release four, the, the um, tawny, mm -hmm. was probably our mutual pick. I'm looking forward to now that this has been open for a little bit to see if Having that grows it, yeah. tomorrow morning yeah. um, and have a go there. But um, we say this live stream goes for an hour from 9 p.m. <laughs> to 10 p.m. It is now officially 10.30 p.m. Uh, partly my fault by choosing four whiskies instead of just one whiskey. Yeah, that's true. But we've also now eight weeks in a row where I think something has not gone completely to plan. Yeah. And I think we might as well just keep that up. So. Yeah. <laughs> if everything goes to plan, we're not doing it right. Yeah, exactly. We can start breaking things. Um, can I have a little bit more of the Chardonnay? Please? Yes. So we're going to keep doing these um, until... Uh, December, we, I don't really know how the last week of December is going to pan out. Um, we have a lot of tastings coming up this week. Glendronach tomorrow night, two nights of Lefroy, all sold out, but potentially the most unique and special and money will never be able to buy it again one is on Friday. Yeah, yes, yeah, so we actually have um, James Erskine of, I guess, Australian wine fame now, not of, of, of Yama and, and of Australian wine fame and one of the, the original people to to really kick start the uh the minimal intervention natural wine movement in australia um and is now highly recognized in the world we're even lucky here in sydney to be getting his wines now they're going to everywhere america denmark um england much to japan a lot to japan heaps to japan um but uh yeah obviously being longtime supporters of james's um he was very very kind and is and um is flying up a day early for his event on Saturday. We're going to be doing a, a, a really quite interesting and, and special masterclass with him on Friday night. Um, he could squeeze us in and uh, just chatting to him this morning. Um, he was in the in the cellars at his place and uh, the full list is online, but basically pulled some stuff going all the way back to 2011 and um, comparative wines from certain vintages where he has added sulfur and not added sulfur to certain barrels. And has bought all those. They like some weren't released. This is just what he did for. That was just him. So if anyone's in Sydney and got enthused by our self conversation yeah. earlier, <laughs> this could be excellent. But we're going to be doing uh, 2011 vintages, 2014 and 15 vintages, plus a bunch of the new releases. Some of them will be. Some of the back vintage stuff would have seen sulfur. Some wouldn't. Um, I so. I'm very excited to be to be thinking about just having that lineup in front and and having um, James. Of all people, take us through them. Yeah, should be. And you know what should the best awesome. thing is, I knock off at six pm, yeah. and I'll be sitting in that room uh, learning about all those things. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I will mention very quickly is to all the uh, signed up, registered Oak Barrel members. Um, our members' Christmas party is happening again this year. Our membership keeps growing, but our floor space does not. So it's going to. Is it the fourth? Yeah, there's going to be an email go at some point this week. Um, to sort of registrations for that, it's been uh, it's it's free, but mm -hmm. RSVPs have been sort of been sucking up in about half an hour quicker every year. Yeah. I think it took about two years, three years ago. Last year was about a year. Uh, sorry, two years ago was about uh, one hour, and then uh, last year about half an hour. So mm -hmm. 
God knows what's going to happen, and get, I hope get, I don't have get, to answer all the phones quick. with the complaints. Because um, again, for the low price of fifty dollars, I'll give you Scott's mobile number. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll see, we'll see how that one goes. <laughs> um, well, Joey, mate, thank you very much. It's been great after two days in the wilderness, fighting as always colds and coughs to um, get back into some real drinks. And yeah, it's good for you. Yeah, it's always really tough drinking like hot lemon water when there's no whiskey in it to make it a hot toddy mm. and you, you keep expecting that and it doesn't quite happen it's, it's quite depressing mm. actually um, but once again uh, thank you all guys for joining us we've had the most um, conversations and comments uh, tonight than, than we have in, in the 8 or 9 weeks we've been doing this um, and just anecdotally looking at the numbers the strongest, the strongest numbers as well so thank you very much um, I will have little bits normally i say you're more than welcome to come down i've got little bits of all these whiskeys so it's going to be first in best dress to, yeah. <laughs> to see whoever the uh, the old glendronic 15 got a little bit smashed the other week after did, we put on the tasting did. so um if you want to try any of these come in and say good day but thank you very much and we will see you in store soon at a tasting for a chat i'm sure we'll see a fair few of you over the next three days yes yes <laughs> definitely yeah it's gonna be good fun yeah. a lot of fun <laughs> Right. Right. right, guys. You gotta end. Yeah. <laughs> Every time. Why did Facebook make it a double button? Man? Why don't I just take end? I'm sure there's been people caught out by that oh, in yeah. very bad yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>